everyone, and welcome to the 25th Annual Whitehall Lecture Series. My name is John Blades. I'm the director of the museum, and it's a pleasure to see you all here this afternoon. I want to take just a couple of minutes to uh, make some opening remarks here. As I said, this is our 25th Annual Whitehall Lecture Series, and actually this year is our 50th anniversary as a public museum. Uh, we're celebrating that all year. And uh, this year's theme of the lecture series is popular entertainment. It's hard to imagine nowadays what people did to entertain themselves 120 years ago or so when there was no TV, there was no radio, there certainly was no internet. Uh, the, none of the things, in fact, we take for granted. So this series explores how people did, in fact, entertain themselves during the Gilded Age. This, uh, these lecture series are webcast live, meaning anybody in the world can join us via the internet to see the same images we are seeing, to hear the audio just as you are hearing it. And we do have some people who have joined us today via the Opal Room. It's the online programming for all libraries program. And I think our farthest away registrant this morning is from Michigan. So welcome to all of you who've joined us via cyberspace, via the internet. We're glad to have you here. Those people who've joined us, uh, and me, if they do, ask questions just as you may uh, following the lecture today. I want to recognize our sponsors that helped make this possible. Our lead sponsor this year is Iberia Bank. Uh, we're very grateful to Iberia Bank for their sponsorship, helping to make these excellent programs possible to you. Uh, and the Palm Beach Post is also a sponsor. I should mention the Palm Beach County Cultural Council as well. They're the arts agency for this county, one of the biggest arts agencies in America, and they fund some 200 arts and cultural groups in the county, helping to bring arts and culture to our county. Did you know that we have more large uh, cultural organizations in Palm Beach County than any coastal county from Texas to Virginia? So when we say Palm Beach is Florida's cultural capital, we say that with some data to back it up. Uh, I want to remind all of you to turn off your cell phones. You don't want one of those to go off and interrupt the presentation today. And if you happen to make it past the staff this morning with your audio tour one, please take a second to return the audio tour one to the staff. You can collect one again at the front door after the lecture, but occasionally the alarms in those audio tour ones can go off as well. I want, speaking of the staff, I want to thank the museum staff for setting up these lectures. There's a lot of work that goes into making one of these possible, and I appreciate the, the hard work of our museum staff. You found at your seat a number of publications, a postcard for the next lecture, which is about uh, the Nickelodeons that were so popular uh, early in the 20th century. Uh, in fact, they got their real start in Pittsburgh, of all places. We don't think of Pittsburgh as the center the center of movie history, but probably we should. There's also a postcard for our next concert coming up this Tuesday with Intersection Trio. We have some of the best chamber music in the world it takes place here at the Flagler Museum in a genuine chamber music environment where only about 100 people are blessed to see really high quality chamber music here and see, I should say. And you have a season program guide which outlines all of the programs available to you this season uh, at the Flagler Museum and at the back of the the uh, program guide is uh, a return mail um, tear out that you can use to become a member if you'd like to support the museum. And certainly the members and contributors make all of this possible, as well as our sponsors, so we thank them. Our lecture today is about the history of magic. And there's probably no better person in the world to talk about the history of magicians and how they were rock stars back in the 19th century. Um, than uh, Jim Steinmeier, who wrote a book, a number of books and essays. The one we have that you can pick up today if you like is called Hiding the Elephant. Jim has made a great study of the characters involved in magic and the, the sort of culture that surrounded those people. And we're fortunate to have Jim. He came out here from Los Angeles. Those of you who know, those of you who fly cross country know how hard it is to come from west to east. It's a, you, have, you lose some time, it's really a tough, uh, a tough journey this way, so we're especially appreciative. And we can't even lure Jim here and say the weather's so great because he lives in Los Angeles. So uh, he's here purely for the love of what he does, and we're happy to have him. So please join me in welcoming Jim Steinmeier to the Whitehall Lecture Series. John, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, and I hope this is of interest. I know it's an esoteric and strange subject to be talking about the history of magic, especially people who aren't dyed-in-the-wool magic fans. 
Uh, and I hope to provide you with a couple of mysteries and to answer some questions. Uh, my occupational hazard is that I won't answer all the questions about magic uh, because there have to be some secrets, but we'll talk a little about uh, some of those secrets as well and some of the important people that developed magic. The golden age of magic corresponds almost exactly with the Gilded Age, and it's interesting that in the Victorian times, magic was completely reinvented by a small group of men. Uh, and, I, and I do have to in advance say men and apologize for that. For some reason, uh, very few women partook in this enterprise. There were one or two, and I'm going to note them, uh, very important figures in the history of magic. Uh, a few women who were important transitional figures. But unfortunately, for some reason, from the Victorian times on, magicians tended to be men, and they tended to, uh, the public tended to associate men with magic as the great magician standing on stage. And so that's how this story is told. I'm going to start with a picture of someone that very few of you will know from looking at this picture who this man is, but all of you will know his name. That's Harry Houdini. Uh, very few people today know what Harry Houdini looked like. They don't know exactly where he lived or what he did. They just know, like the name Merlin, that it is a name associated with magic. That's an especially attractive photograph of a man who wasn't always so photogenic. He was a tiny little man, bow-legged, uh, rather muscular, not necessarily handsome, but he was an important figure in the world of magic. Now, how important a figure? That's something we can debate. Um, Houdini was not known to the public at the time he was working primarily as a magician. He was known as an escape artist. There were other magicians working, his contemporaries, who were well known to the public as magicians, and especially America's great magicians. Uh, Houdini struggled all his life to be associated with magic. He was certainly qualified. He was a magic historian. He was a magic collector. He knew a great deal about the history of magic and wrote about the history of magic in some kind of odd books, which I'm going to note as we get into the story. So he certainly was qualified. But he achieved fame by escaping out of things. And he was a vaudeville artist. He was a vaudeville act almost through his entire career. He was known to, to the public as a vaudeville act, which meant that he was the star on the vaudeville bill. And the show primarily consisted of his amazing escapes, kind of daredevil stunts. Um, but despite the fact that his background was in magic. Now, Houdini was a, is a, is a troubling personality. I'm going to start with him because we're going to end with him. And I want to show you where this all comes from. Because I think that's an important part of the story is to see the generations that led directly to this man. And that is the strange part. You're going to see directly how this leads to this important figure in the vaudeville era. He was a tricky personality. His, his, uh, his contemporaries didn't necessarily like him. He was egotistical. He was difficult. He was childish often. Um, there has been a certain revisionism written about Houdini and the great Houdini in the last 20 or 30 years. And I wrote one of those books. Um, just to show you that it, it is still highly debated, a very good friend of mine, Bill Kalush, uh, together with another author, Larry Sloman, wrote a brilliant biography of Houdini about three years ago, uh, in which they turn the revision on its ear again and say that Houdini was, in fact, a very talented performer, uh, a very skillful magician, and that his critics were wrong. So his personality and his achievements are still being debated today, uh, just as his fame is being uh, celebrated by all the public who don't have any idea who he was or why he's so famous. So I'm going to go back a number of years. I'm going to go back to the 1840s when this man was in his prime. This is a photo taken of him when he was in retirement several years later in the 1860s. This man is a French magician named Jean ou Jean Rouberudin. Now, I'll do my best to pronounce that. As the French pronounced it, he was a Parisian magician who was born in Blois, France, and a chief fame in Paris. He was the great Victorian, early Victorian magician. And he was, in fact, the man who defined magic for generations of important magicians to come after him. The connection, as we're going to see at the end, but I want, I want to give you some hint of where we're going. His last name is a hyphenated name, Roberudin. R-O-B-E-R-T hyphen, and that was the name he was born with. And then he added his wife's name when he married. And his wife's name was Cecile Udon. And that's spelled H-O-U-D-I-N. If that sounds familiar to you, Houdin, or if that spelling seems familiar to you, H-O-U-D-I-N, it is because those are the first letters of the name Houdini. Harry Houdini was born Eric Weiss uh, in Budapest in 1874. And his family immigrated to America shortly after that. They settled in Appleton, Wisconsin. He always considered himself an American all through his life. He said he was born in America. That's not true. When he was a young man, he read the Confidence of a Press Digitator, the Confidence of the Press Digitator, Robert Dan's spectacular autobiography. Uh, 
and he decided that he wanted to become a light or bear down. And so he acquired his name, H-O-U-D-I-N, he had an I to the end, in a kind of imitation of the Italian, the way magicians at that time were often associated with Italian performers and mountbanks, and he became Houdini. Now there's a strange twist to this because he ended up going back and turning his back on this performer in a kind of strange uh, way of, of denying his parentage. But he directly took inspiration from this magician. It wasn't just Houdini. Robert Down was a very important figure uh, in Victorian magic. Innovative, creative, celebrated. Today, we uh, historians still doubt whether his biography is inflated, whether it's been exaggerated, whether he's achieved all of the fame that he claimed to have achieved. And I think it's safe to say for people who examined his, has, have in recent years examined his autobiography, that there are exaggerations in it. He certainly played with his childhood and he's added a number of coincidences and wonderful picaresque stories to enhance his autobiography. But it is a brilliant story about a, a young man in Paris who was trained a, as a watchmaker, who was an expert in mechanics, and then turned to the field of magic and conjuring. And in the course of doing it, he brushed off all of the old traits, he brushed off all of the kind of costume uh, affectations that magicians were want to utilize at that time. He dressed it up, he put it bef before proper Parisian audiences, and he made it a sophisticated form of entertainment. He was imitated by the generation that came after him, as late as Houdini, in the, who worked into the 1920s. Now, one of the most amazing stories told about Robert Dan, uh, which is written of in his autobiography, and which is completely true, is his quelling of an uprising in uh, French Algiers in 1856. He was retired at the time and well known as a, as a popular magician. And the French were struggling with a tribe in Algiers called the Marabou, which were a group of uh, holy men. And the Marabou claimed to have special magical abilities. Uh, they probably were some kind of um, uh, skills in prestidigitation and conjuring. But the French decided that it would be a wise thing to send a real French magician down to Algiers to convince them that their magic, the French magic, was actually superior. So Robert Dan was taken out of retirement at the request of the government, sent to Algiers, where he performed a week of engagements at a theater there in order to demonstrate the superiority of French magic. Now, one of the most amazing things that he did during that show is just to celebrate it as an amazing bit of magic technology, where magic and technology crossed in a fantastic demonstration. He closed the show with a small wooden chest about the size of a jewel box that had a handle on the top of it. And he placed it in the center of the stage, and he invited one of the strongest of the Merriman tribesmen up to assist him on the stage. And he asked him if he thought he was capable of picking up that box. And the man, of course, said yes, and he reached out and picked the box up, placed it back down on the stage. And then Robert then waved his wand, and he said, I drain all of your strength from your body so that you are weaker than the weakest child, you are weaker than the weakest woman. And he asked him to pick up the box, and the man strained and was unable to pick up the box. And then he restored his strength and demonstrated it again. The second time, when he asked him to pick it up and he was unable to, the man collapsed to his knees as if a shock seemed to go through his body, and he ran from the theater screaming. This was a very effective demonstration of the French superiority. It was also a very effective demonstration of a little known scientific principle called electromagnetism. The box was lined with uh, iron, and underneath the stage was a powerful electromagnet that Robert Dan, on a signal, was engaged so the box couldn't be lifted. Now, uh, electromagnetism had been demonstrated to the public before this time, before the 1850s, but it was little known by the public, and it certainly was not known in Algiers. What's interesting, and what often isn't explained, and I think is significant to the story, is not only the significance of, of that little scene, but how it differed from how Robert Dan presented it. It's also a story about magicians' presentations and how important those are. He had actually performed the light handling chess in his theater in Paris during his career. When he performed it in his theater in Paris, it was called the light and heavy chess. And he exhibited it as a special little chest that would grow heavy at his own command so that it could not be lifted and the contents of it couldn't be stolen. And that's how he performed it in Paris. But you'll see a very subtle difference when he went to Algiers. And in Algiers, it wasn't the chest that became heavy, it was the man who became weak. And that was the important demonstration. That's how he 
very cleverly and psychologically exerted control over his audience by demonstrating not that he had a special box, because that, in essence, was about the trick itself. It was about his power over the tribesmen that he was performing for. Uh, Robert then had an illustrious career. This is an engraving um, from his career when he was performing in Paris. He had an amazing way of combining mechanical devices with sleight of hand in a kind of seamless presentation. This is a, a beautiful piece that he performed. It was a mechanical orange tree that seemed to bloom oranges on the tree, first buds and then small oranges and then larger oranges. Finally, one of the oranges opened up at the top of the tree and two mechanical butterflies lifted out a handkerchief that he had borrowed from the audience and they disappeared and displayed it. Um, his pieces were beautiful combinations of mechanical uh, works and he was, after all, trained as a watchmaker, so he was very skillful as a mechanical magician. Now, an interesting thing happened shortly after his retirement and shortly after this trip to Algiers, which changed magic forever, and it's the work of this man. This is someone who I know you haven't seen the picture of. In fact, a few years ago, I would not have recognized that picture because the photographs of this fellow are very rare indeed. This is a picture of an English scientist and chemist named John Henry Pepper. Now, Mr. Pepper uh, exhibited a museum, uh, the London Polytechnic, which was a strange concoction of scientific displays and popular entertainments and magic shows in the way that all of those things were combined for the early Victorians. And in 1862, a, an inventor came to him with an idea. The man's name was Dirks. Dirks came to Professor Pepper and he suggested that he had a way of creating an optical illusion, a very special optical illusion, in which he could put ghosts on stage interacting with actors. What I mean is actual ghosts were transparent that could act the scene in conjunction with flesh and blood actors on the stage. And so Dirks uh, built a small model of this Professor Pepper altered it so that it would work on a uh, normal stage, filed a patent in conjunction with Dirks, and it was exhibited at the Polytechnic under the name of Pepper's Ghost. Now, Pepper's Ghost became famous in its day. You'll, you'll read about it today. You'll see references to it as one of the early links to early cinema. Uh, this was one of the, the, the important devices in the early stage parlance that led to the kind of spectacular effects that eventually led to the cinema. In fact, it became very important for magicians because it, it formalized something that magicians didn't have before, which was optical illusions on stage, which was the, the use of enormous optical principles, important optical principles, in conjunction with their magic. Robert Ann used mechanics, incredible devices, clockworks, and sleight of hand. And with the age of Professor Pepper and the London Polytechnic, he introduced something on stage this is what started the cliche that it's all done with mirrors, because Pepper's ghost was accomplished with an amazing use of reflections in conjunction with ghost, uh, a ghost glass, a piece of glass, and sometimes with silver glass as well, a mirror. And so it was the later devices inspired by John Henry Pepper that led to the cliche, it's all done with mirrors. And these inventions eventually led their way into the performances of magicians as well. Now, the next generation from Robert Rodin was an amazing British magician, John Neville Maskelyne. John Neville Maskelyne was born in Cheltenham in 1839. Um, he toured as a young man with a magic show that was an imitation of other shows of the day. He had a cabinet of illusion that was of his own invention that was inspired by some of the work of Pepper uh, using mirrors. And he performed a, a popular tricks that were an imitation of the popular magicians. And he'd be completely forgotten if he had stayed in Cheltenham and toured around the Cheltenham area with his partner, a man named George Cook. But instead, Masculine and Cook opened a theater in London. It was an ambitious plan. It was slightly crazy because no one at the time thought that a magician could actually open their own theater in London. But he was clearly inspired by the success of Robert Dan one generation earlier. In fact, we see a lot of things in which uh, a lot of elements in his life in which Maskelyne styled himself directly after Robert Rodin. Uh, he describes himself as a watchmaker. He actually, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. He was a mechanician. But he wanted to be like Robert Rodin, and he sought to open his own theater in a European capital in the style of Robert Rodin. And so in 1871, he and George Cook opened Egyptian Hall, uh, the second floor theater in Egyptian Hall. Now, Egyptian Hall was already in existence. It was a strange, again, one of those strange Victorian buildings 
one of the strange Victorian museums, which was a combination of small theater spaces, uh, lecture rooms, exhibit spaces, and it was all done up with a kind of faux Egyptian style with plaster and brightly painted uh, in Piccadilly in London. Massimo and Cook rented the second floor of Egyptian Hall and put on their magic show there. And they were hoping to keep it open for six months. It remained in Egyptian Hall until 1900 when the building was raised, and then they moved it to another theater where it continued into the 30s. Uh, the name Maskelin in London what became a complete trade name for magic, the way Houdini is, is today. And Maskelin and Cook, and later his partner Maskelin and Devant, became a kind of shorthand way of talking about stage magic in, uh, in Great Britain. In fact, if you ever see the play uh, Blythe Spirit by Noel Coward, which was written in the 30s, you'll hear the ghost, you'll hear the, them ask the ghost about performing some little trick to demonstrate her presence. And she says, oh, I don't go in for any of that masculine and devant sort of stuff. That was the way that the public heard about magic in those days. Now, masculine was primarily a mechanician and an exhibitor. He was a, a, an ingenious showman who stayed in front of the public with a lot of boasts, uh, some court cases, some challenges, and a number of incredible inventions. Uh, one of his inventions was a, uh, a mechanical man that was shown to the audience. The, Invention was opened up to show that it was all pure mechanics, that nothing or no one was concealed inside. Then it was closed up. It was isolated on a, on a glass column on stage so that everyone knew that there were no connections to it of any kind. And there it was given a hand of cards, a hand of playing cards. And this mechanism, which was named Psycho, would play a game of whist opposite three other people in the audience. Whist was an early, early version of bridge. And Psycho invariably not only played intelligently, but won the game. Uh, Psycho was an amazing mechanical device that seemed like it was a mechanical device that could actually think. It wasn't. It was a magic trick. Psycho was controlled by someone behind the scenes through an amazing and ingenious method, uh, an invention by a man named John Algernon Clark that, that uh, Masculine invented and perfected. But his show was full of these kind of wonders, amazing mechanical devices combined with other magicians, other sleight of hand artists that he would bring to his stage who would be the guest acts at Egyptian Hall. Egyptian Hall was a very, very popular um, tourist attraction, and the, uh, the bills always said daily at 3 and 8. They were one of the first theaters to offer matinees, and that was a, a direct result of uh, family audiences, children, coming to see the shows. Um, it was a mysterious place, and the shows fitted in perfectly in Egyptian Hall, but in 1900, Piccadilly was widened, the street was going to be widened, and the theater had to be torn down. And Maskelin faced a dilemma, which is what he was going to do with his with his space without this beautiful little 200 seat theater to show his magic. He ambitiously moved up Regent Street to a place called St. George's Hall. And St. George's Hall was more than twice as large. It was a real theater. And he now had to face the example of what he was going to do to attract an audience and to move his shows even further along in an era when all this sort of magic had been seen by the public. Now, fortunately, he had hired a young man uh, in the 1890s by the name of David Devant. Uh, David Devant is a hero of mine in this story because I think he was a, a brilliant conjurer of the old sense who also brought it into this new era. He was certainly a, of the generation later than Maskelin, and there was a lot of friction between these two men because Maskelin was of the old style and wanted the magic done of the old style, and Devant wanted it done of the new style. And the new style in that time, just after the turn of the century, was elegant conjuring, sleight of hand, beautifully done, simply done, emphasizing the art of it. It was a new way of looking at magic. Now, Demand was popular with Masculine's touring company, and he was busy with Masculine's touring company, uh, traveling through the provinces, when Masculine went to St. George's Hall, when he moved his base of operations from Egyptian Hall to St. George's Hall. And when he did that, an amazing event happened in which magic almost changed. And I say that, it's not often described by magicians in history books. Often magicians talk about how the theater moved from a smaller theater to a larger theater. It talks about the imminent success of the masculine and divan partnership. But in fact, it was a very perilous time in the history of magic, those years, because they almost lost it and they almost changed the way magic was performed forever. And it was this man who fortuitously was there right at the right time to bring it back and to bring beautiful conjuring back to a new generation, which was then perpetuated by the next generation of performers. Here's what happened. 
Um, at the time, around 1900, there was an increasing interest in special effects in the theater. And Maskell watched this with some jealousy. He had been called into Henry Irving Productions to uh, provide special magical effects in his Shakespeare plays. But there were amazing things being done on the West End stages. And I mentioned, for example, shows like The Whip, where they would place, they would portray an entire horse race on stage, or they would portray a train wreck on stage. Very elaborate, mechanical, melodramatic effects. And Maskelyne watched these with some jealousy because he knew that he could not only do these, but he could do these better. And that as a magician, he could attract audiences with more amazing effects. So he decided when he moved to St. George's Hall to stop the magic shows, stop mirror magic shows, and to now become a producer of magic spectacle. And he did it with a show called The Coming Race, which was based on a, science, a very early science fiction novel by Lord Lytton, Lord Lytton who wrote um, uh, a number of uh, popular novels of the day. And the coming race involved a race of people, supposedly, under the crust of the earth, uh, who lived with a bunch of prehistoric monsters and mechanical men, and they had, they had uh, conquered a, a special force called Vril, which allowed them to levitate mysteriously. And Maslow knew that he could do all of these things, and he did, he spent lavishly, and he produced at St. George's Hall a new production of The Coming Race, which would, on paper, uh, compete with any show that was in the West End by being more amazing and more spectacular. Now we don't know exactly what happened to the coming race. It closed in the matter of weeks. We know it was a disaster. We know that audiences didn't want to see it. And when David Devant later wrote about it, he said rather innocently that he never saw the show, that he was on tour in the provinces at the time and couldn't offer an opinion on it. And this seems like a very pale criticism. It seems like someone who's trying to get out of arguing about it when he wrote that. He must have known what was happening. He was one of the partners in the business. But he did report that his money from these provincial shows was going back to London to pay for all the overages in the coming race. So the coming race was a complete disaster, and we might ask why. We might ask why Masculine wasn't able to compete with the West End Magic, even though he was a great magician. And there are a few answers to this. Um, a few weeks earlier in the West End, Another show opened for the first time at the Duke of York's theater. It was called Peter Pan. That was the first time London audience has ever seen J.M. Barry's play. And of course, in, in Barry's play, the characters fly around the stage and they fly around with wires. And everyone can see the wires in Peter Pan. It was a system done by a company called the Kirby's that for a long time had flown all of the actors in, in spectacular British productions. But Peter Pan was a story which made you ignore all of the fantasy. It was, uh, every theater student knows the phrase, the willing suspension of disbelief, Coleridge's phrase about the theater. That you go into the theater and you willingly suspend your disbelief. You will not look at the wire that holds Peter Pan up because you will imagine that Peter Pan is flying. And what John Neville Masculine wasn't able to do was have his audience willingly suspend their disbelief. He was a magician and he challenged them. And the coming race was clearly a mixture of these principles that didn't work together. He tried to perfect all of the magic on stage so that it was amazing as well as story driven. And it ended up being amazing and not story driven at all. His audiences weren't attracted to it. They weren't interested in those stories. They were only interested in seeing the magic. The man who saved the day was David Devant, who came back from the provinces, was summoned back to London, and then went back to uh, St. George's Hall. And they didn't know what to do with this enormous theater. And Devant came in and performed his show, the show that he'd been doing in the provinces. What was his show? If you read the show today, it sounds like the oldest type of magic show imaginable. One of his tricks was to take a kettle uh, to demonstrate that it was filled with water. He would pour out glasses of water and hand them to the audience. And then he would tell a wonderful little story, a fantastic story, about getting this, this kettle from a, an Irishman in a pub who used it to get around the, uh, the uh, liquor laws. And then he would ask the audience to call out the names of drinks, and they would call out gin, benedictine, and uh, port, and wine, and he would pour those drinks from the kettle and hand them out to the audience. This is a great trick. It was a trick that was performed by Robert Dan three generations earlier, with a bottle instead of a kettle. Uh, Devant performed beautiful, elegant magic and performed it just as a magician. He knew that his job was to challenge the audience, 
and to not ask the audience to suspend their disbelief, but to bring their disbelief to the theater, and then he, his goal was to conquer it. The example that I used in a book was that uh, if you were sitting in your room sometime and a painting fell off the wall and fell to the ground, you would probably forget that incident a week later. You would fix the hook, or you would repair the wire that held it, and you would put the painting back up. If a spiritualist happened to be holding a seance in your room at the same time that happened, that event would change your life. And the difference is, is that a magician calls attention to those things, makes those things special. And the work of a special effects artist, what Masculine was trying to do without knowing it, is to create effects that are so perfectly integrated into the story that you temporarily ignore them. You believe that Peter Pan will fly, just as today we accept that Superman will fly, and we stop wondering about how that's done. Now, one of the strange curses of David Devan as being an innovator is that he was one of the first men, uh, he probably was the first man in London to exhibit on a regular basis an invention called the motion picture. He read about it, he found a motion picture uh, projector from a man named R, uh, R. Paul, and he exhibited it at Egyptian Hall before they lost the lease uh, just around 19, in the late 1800s. Uh, Maslin did not think it would be a success, his quote was that it would be a five days wonder. He didn't think that it would succeed. Devant knew that it would be a success, and it was a huge success uh, for the Masculine Devant Company. Unfortunately, it also was their undoing, uh, not in their own hands, but as it became popular with the public, of course, it was eventually the motion pictures that unseated magicians and, and provided a new kind of magic to the audience and changed the way all of those entertainments were seen. So on January 2nd, 1905, uh, shortly after Peter Pan opened, the coming race opened and was a complete failure. And on April 24th, 1905, a very modest show called The Feast of Magic went back to St. George's Hall and was premiered for an audience and it became a huge success and David Devant became London's leading magician. It was a humiliation for John Neville Maston, the old man, who then had to go out in the provinces and tour and not only that, perform the tricks that were invented by his young associate, not his own tricks, tricks that were invented by his young associate, and that's how he ended his career, was by performing provincial shows as well as in London. Uh, it was a humiliation that unfortunately undid that partnership in a, in a nasty way, and it was, uh, it was unfortunate because though that was the partnership that almost changed everything and brought it back. One of the band's uh, great illusions, in fact, one that we had a chance to, to recreate in a conference that we do in Los Angeles, uh, was an illusion called uh, The Chocolate Soldier. The Chocolate Soldier was the name of a popular melodrama of the day, a um, uh, musical uh, written by Victor Herbert. And Devant portrayed his own magical version of The Chocolate Soldier. And I include this because it's, it's quite rare. It's one of the few pictures we have of these performers on stage. This is from uh, about 1912, 1915. And it was, it was not practical to bring photographs into theaters at that time and to pose for action. They would have to stop the show. These were all had to be specially posed. But here's a, a, an unusual picture of what, one of the man's illusions on stage at St. George's Hall in London. Uh, the illusion was that he introduced a soldier that he said was made completely of chocolate, much like the name of the show that was running in the West End, The Chocolate Soldier. And the soldier was lifted up onto that stand and surrounded by those upright battens of bright lights so that he was, he was bathed in bright lights on three sides. And then Devant temporarily covered the soldier with the flags, forming a kind of triangle around it. And seconds later, the flags were taken away, and the soldier had melted to a one-foot-tall little mechanical chocolate soldier that was marching on the stand. All of Devant's illusions were, were simple and elegant and had a, had a kind of beautiful simplicity of plot to them. And he basically redefined the way magicians then looked at their art in the following generations. The people who succeeded him, and I'm going to talk a little about that, were certainly influenced greatly by Devant's important influence. But I want to go back a little bit in time because I want to bring the story over to the United States. It didn't just happen in France and England, even though that, that did, was the origin, origins of uh, many of our great magicians. And I want to show you this man. <clears throat> now, many of you, unlike looking at the picture of Houdini and saying, who is that? You might look at this and say, I know this guy. This is a magician. This guy's a magician. And in fact, this guy was a magician. This was a magician named Alexander Herman. He was, in his age, in the Gilded Age, America's great magician. Now, I have to 
qualify that. He wasn't American at all. He was uh, born of a German family, a family of magicians, in fact. His oldest brother was a magician, and their father before them was a magician. Alexander Herman was the youngest of the brothers. He was a bright, uh, charismatic, comical, fantastic star on the stage. He performed in, in Paris for a number of years, but then in London at Egyptian Hall before masculine performed there. And then he came over to the United States in the 1870s and became a sensation. He was a great man of the theater. He was classed in his age with any great uh, American actor like Joseph Jefferson, like uh, uh, Edwin Booth. He was contemporaries of these, and he knew all of these men, and he toured and managed his own show. The reason he looks familiar to you is because he became our cliche of a magician. He was a man about five foot ten inches tall, very thin. He had a goatee, as you see, that he, and he teased his hair so that he looked like Mephistopheles. He used to wear a cutaway tail coat. He used to wear knee breeches and black pumps. He spoke with the French accent on stage and made very funny puns in fractured American English. And his audiences were completely charmed by him. Every time a magician is drawn in a cartoon book today, they draw Alexander Herman, and they don't know why they're drawing him. But this is the man who created that impression. Now, he was copied. Uh, he had relatives who copied him and who copied his appearance. And there were Hermans in vaudeville into the 20s and the 30s, uh, kind of bad imitations of, of, uh, of uh, Alexander Herman. Herman died in 1896. His wife, uh, Adelaide Herman, was his co-star in the show. And when he died, she became uh, a leading magician and became a very successful vaudeville star. A vaudeville star, incidentally. Not merely just an act. She did an entire show, her own show in vaudeville, 30 minutes long, uh, several acts long. And Adelaide Herman was one of the few really successful female magicians. Uh, she had started her career as a dancer. She started as a, with a bicycle act. She was skillful on stage in many different areas. And when she decided to become a magician upon her husband's death, um, she did it with great grace and with an enormous, spectacular show. It was very popular with the public. More than likely, she continued because she had no money. Uh, Alexander Herman lived high on the hog, as they say. Um, and there was some embarrassment when he died. Uh, she found that there was, there was no money. In fact, there were debts. He had a train car. I was uh, reminded of it with the Flagler's was a beautiful train car. Alexander Herman had his own train car that he toured with, uh, similar to Mr. Flagler's. And it was uh, actually had been Lily Langtree's train car, the um, popular American actress before that. But he didn't have the money to support these things. He had overspent, and he was careless about money. He had his own yacht, he had his own estate in New York, in Queens, and he hadn't paid the bills on any of those things. And Adelaide was forced to go to work upon his death in 1896. Upon Herman's death, there started a kind of strange succession of magicians from one to the other. And uh, for some reason, America always had one great magician during this time. Uh, they always accepted one magician as the greatest, and the others were always the also great. And upon Herman's death, the mantle went to this man, Harry Keller. Now, Harry Keller does not look like a magician to you or I. Uh, he was a tall, bald, charming fellow who overcame many things. He had thick hands. He couldn't perform sleight of hand. He started his performing career with a speech defect and didn't speak clearly, and he had to learn to speak clearly. And he was a very aggressive American salesman. He sold himself on stage, and he sold his magic on stage and became the public's favorite. Uh, I'll explain a lot to you by explaining the speculation, Martin Gardner's speculation, the famous author, science writer, that Harry Keller, if you look at the years, was clearly the inspiration for The Wizard of Oz, L. Frank Baum's character of the miraculous wizard in his books, the little bald man who travels from town to town, who is partly con man and partly wizard. And that was Harry Keller. That was his appeal to the public. He became, he was, he, he was touring up, uh, starting in the 1870s. He always butted head with, with Alexander Herman. They were rivals. But upon Herman's death in 1896, Harry Keller ascended to the throne, so to speak, and he, he had America's great man. 
Now, Keller always had a, a whiff of the unsavory about him in all his business dealings. He was a very aggressive American salesman and businessman, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. He regularly went over to Egyptian Hall, and then later St. George's Hall, and he stole whatever tricks he wanted from those people. He would go and look at them, he would hire assistants, he would pay people, he would, uh, the report is that he would go to the theater with opera glasses and watch, come and watch show after show after show, and then he would go back to America and recreate those effects, and he would present them as his own originations. Uh, one of the greatest of those was a levitation effect that stumped him, completely stumped him. It stumped many illusions, uh, illusionists and magicians of the time. Uh, John Neville Maskell presented it as the entranced fakir in 1901. Harry Keller wanted it, he couldn't find the secret, and so he hired one of Maskell's staff, a German magician named Paul Valadon. And he brought him over and he introduced him to the public as his successor, the man who would take over his show. And shortly after that, a new illusion premiered in Harry Keller's show called The Levitation of Princess Carmack. And it was, in fact, John Neville Maskell's levitation. The secret was provided by Paul Valadon. As in the matter of many of these spy mysteries, Valadon got the worst of it. After several seasons with Thurston, or after several seasons of touring with Keller, he was overthrown. Uh, the wives didn't get along. It's reported. Uh, Valadon was a tricky personality off stage. He was temperamental, and Keller's wife was also temperamental. And after a blow up, Valadon was tossed out, and this man, Howard Thurston, became Harry Keller's successor. And it was a regal act of succession, just like any kind of coronation. They toured for one season in which Harry Keller introduced Howard Thurston as his successor to the American public at every performance. And then the final performance of that tour, which was in Baltimore at Ford's Theater, Harry Keller handed over his wand to Howard Thurston, put his hand on his back, and introduced him as the man who would take over his show. And, Her and Howard Thurston became America's greatest magician, starting in 1908. How did that happen? How did that happen not only with Valadon? Well, we, we come to a, a point in the story, at the end of the story, which is near and dear to my heart. I spent two years writing the biography of this man, Howard Thurston. Uh, the biography ho hopefully will be out later this year. It's published by Penguin. It's called, the tenor title is, The Last Greatest Magician in the World. He was, in fact, the last greatest magician in the world, America's last great magician. And he was the man who took traditions from his good friend, David Devant, in England, and inventions from him. He took the traditions of the Keller Show, and he brought them out of the Gilded Age and brought them into the modern 20th century with a modern review show with 20 girls in beautiful costumes, lavish scenery, carloads of equipment. Not the charming little personal show that magicians were doing, but the spectacular show that was, in its day, every bit equal to the franchise that other people had in the theater. When we say Ringling Brothers today, when we say Ziegfeld today, when we say um, other uh, names of other producers uh, that were popular in the day, uh, like Belasco, the name Thurston was, in its day, considered the public an equal with that. Thurston Show was an American institution, and it toured between 1908 to 1936. It was a huge success. I dare say if you were, if your grandparents were anywhere on the East Coast at that time, they saw the first of show. It came to East Coast cities and Midwest cities year after year after year. And um, he toured until 1936 when he was then struggling to compete with motion pictures. He very often, in the end of that, in, in those last years, toured a one hour show that played with motion pictures and he would do that one hour show five times a day. It was not good work for a man in his early 60s, and it took a toll on him. And he, uh, uh, he died of a stroke during one of those last tours. Now, Thurston was a contemporary uh, of Houdini. But Thurston was the man that the public associated with magic. This is a photograph, another unusual photograph. Again, at this day, we don't have many photos of magicians on stage with their magic. But this is a photo of Thurston presenting the levitation of Princess Karnak, Harry Keller's great illusion that he went to so much trouble to steal from London and then bring to America and copy. He had it built by the Otis Elevator Company in Yonkers, New York, because they knew the safety tolerances of all of the mechanics that were involved. This piece of apparatus then passed to Howard Thurston. He performed it in every single performance from 1908 to 1936. It was 
one of the highlights of the show. He never did a show without it. Uh, it ran somewhere between 12 and 18 minutes on stage. And it was a complete Arabian Nights fantasy, in which he talked about the rituals of the temples of love in Allahabad, in India, and then he invited a group of people up on stage to watch the floating princess. And he would, he would take a small boy from the audience and he would walk him up to the princess and ask him to raise his hand and touch the ring of the floating princess and make a wish. And if he made a wish, the wish would come true. As Thurston said, true in India, true here. And for many years, you would find men, older men, who would, who, who would tell me I was the boy that went up on stage and touched the floating princess's ring. It happened in every show. Those people, unfortunately, are gone now. Uh, there's a gentleman here in the audience who saw Hardeen, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, he was lucky enough to see Hardeen when he was a young man and just introduced himself to me. But the people who saw Thurston, unfortunately, are, are going quickly. His last show was in 1936. Now, a direct contemporary of Thurston's was this man. Ah, you've seen that picture before. And so now we made a complete full circle. Back to Harry Houdini, the vaudeville artist, the man who had, was frustrated being a magician. Houdini ended up writing a very strange book called The Unmasking of Robert Rodin. He started collecting material on the history of magic. I told you he was a troublesome personality. Uh, we still wonder about his personality. When he collected material on Robert Rodin, his idol, he found, much to his horror, that Robert Rodin had exaggerated his biography and might have exaggerated some of his credentials. Now, I can't tell you how ordinary it is for a showman to exaggerate his biography or exaggerate his credentials. Uh, I will point out that we now know that Harry Houdini is a ghostwriter with almost everything he wrote, and he exaggerated almost every story about his, his childhood and about his achievements on the stage. But he was horrified to find that his spiritual father, Robert Rodin, did the same thing. And so he wrote a book called The Unmasking of Robert Rodin, which was a vicious and savage attempt to knock down his hero and right the wrongs that were committed and claim, that all, claim all of the exaggerations that Robert Rodin had written. And it was, I think we're safe to say today, a very perverse example of history, trying to set the record straight. If he had only taken all of that scholarship and directed it towards a real book on magic history, we would be celebrating him in very different terms than we are today. But for some reason, it was not always enough for Houdini to be successful. Part of his complex personality was to reduce all the other people in show business to a status far below him. He did that with, uh, uh, with his contemporaries like Thurston, and they had a very rocky relationship, which I've had a chance to write about in the last year. And uh, he did it even with the generations before him, Robert Rodin, so that his name would shine brighter. And in fact, that's what happened today. Uh, today, we don't know the name of Robert Rodin. It's almost completely forgotten except by magicians. And the public knows the name Houdini, the imitator, even though they don't know why they know that name. He succeeded in all of his publicity. Many of these people were celebrated as masters of deception, and I just want to say, to conclude, that while they are good at deception, I think it's unfair to say that they are masters of deception any more than used car salesmen are, or advertising executives, or the man who's trying to get you to sign a plumbing contract. Um, <clears throat> David Thompson, in a, uh, a book, wrote, uh, wrote about, quote, the dainty torture of a magic show, the small talk that traps, unquote. And that really is the elegance of pure conjuring. That is what David Devant was doing and what Howard Thurston did at the height of his career, and what Houdini did for, for late in his career when he brought magic finally back to the audience and combined it with his escapes. It was pure conjuring. It was a reassuring fantasy based on innocent little lies that are assembled to form a battlement for the illusion. And it's important to keep that in mind. Magicians don't fool people. They are the facilitators to let them fool themselves, because we're all willing to do it. As much as people have been wanting to tell stories to each other for years and years, and people point out how that is a timeless art, there's one art that's even more ancient than storytelling, and that is the belief that there's something more incredible, and the fantasy that you assemble in your own mind that there are incredible things out there. And ultimately, these people who redefine magic and who are still being copied today in all of the magicians that are working, are the people who presented their audiences with situations, assumptions, and little lies, and allowed them all to deceive themselves. Thank you. I think we do questions, and uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to uh, 
entertain them. I know we have a few minutes. Yes, yes, sir, right here. Uh, Harry Blackstone, can you, where does he fit in? Harry Blackstone. Blackstone. Uh, I had a, qu a question about Harry Blackstone, the magician. And Harry Blackstone is just about of the age of folks that saw, would have seen him. Uh, Harry Blackstone was of a generation after Thurston. Late in Thurston's career, Blackstone provided some real competition and they butted heads. Um, he was a later generation and upon Thurston's death, Blackstone really became America's great magician. The only problem is by then, by 1936, the whole tradition of magic would change. And there was no, it, it was a role that kind of couldn't be fulfilled. Blackstone toured for many years with a very successful show and he was an aggressive and very clever showman. But there, the, the role of America's Great Magician had been passed by with the success of uh, motion pictures and different forms of entertainment. Harry Blackstone worked up until the 1950s. Uh, Hardeen, I should explain, the gentleman who saw Hardeen, Hardeen was Houdini's brother. And when Houdini had a lot of competition in vaudeville, he decided it was silly to have all this competition, he should stay in the family. So he took his brother, who had worked with him early in his act, and he set him up in his act, didn't explain to Booker's that he was his brother, and built him as Hardeen. So there was a second escape artist there. And his brother outlived Houdini and performed up until the 1940s. And uh, the gentleman here saw Hardeen's last performance in Brooklyn in the 1940s. And he was, by all accounts, a very skillful magician. Could do Houdini's tricks and also uh, additional magic as well. Jim. Yes. Um, what's the connection between movies and magicians? How, how do they affect one another? Uh, there's a there's a definite connection between movies and magicians, and and um, uh, much much like a horror movie, when you read this history, you want to scream back at the at the pages of the book or the screen. You know, don't go in that closet. Don't open the door. Uh, as I mentioned to you, David Devant was the first to bring motion pictures on a regular basis, on regular performances, to London at Egyptian Hall, and then he bettered that by producing his own little trick films. The Theatre Robert Dan in London, in Paris, after Robert Dan's retirement, it was managed by a number of magicians, uh, including a, a son-in-law and then a number of, of uh, French magicians, many of whom we've forgotten today. One of the last to manage the Theatre Robert Dan was a French magician named Georges Méliès. And that name might be slightly familiar to you. Georges Méliès, uh, on the top floor of the theatre, uh, two brothers, the Lumiere brothers, were running a small space where they made motion picture projectors and cameras. And Meliers, because he was a, a scenic artist as well as a magician, started making small movies at the Theatre of Verdun, trick films. And it was George Meliers who basically invented the trick film, superimposed film, stop action film, all of those techniques. And the films that you've probably seen, the, the trip to the moon where the, the spaceship flies in the moon's eye, and the kind of early fantasy films are Georges Méliès' productions. Uh, he eventually, his film business eventually overtook the magic business and he uh, uh, ended up producing films and then unfortunately he died a very sad death uh, selling toys in a uh, uh, kiosk in the streets of London. The films didn't support him, the magic hadn't supported him and he had his own little business selling toys to tourists. Um, in many ways, early magicians supported the film business, nurtured it, brought it in front of the public, put it in front of the public for the first time, and it became the sort of Frankenstein monster that reached up and grabbed it by the throat and strangled it. Jim, can you, I don't know if you can tell us, but can you tell us about, and if you can't tell us how it worked, how Houdini made an elephant disappear at the Hippodrome? Yes. Well, Houdini, was, Houdini did very little magic in his career. He tried several times, and the public didn't want to accept him as a magician. But a typically flamboyant Houdini trick was that in uh, 1914, he vanished, I'm sorry, 1912, he made an elephant disappear at the New York Hippodrome, the largest stage in America, and the largest trick ever performed, he made an elephant disappear. Uh, it was typical Houdini bravado. From all accounts, it wasn't a very good trick, and uh, we struggled, I say we, later generations of magicians, struggled to try and find out what it was, because it was, so badly reported, the reports of it were so poor, and the magicians, fellow magicians were so unimpressed with it that it was difficult to find out exactly how he was accomplishing it. And uh, years later, I did some research uh, about the secrets uh, and where these came from. Houdini, 
acquired the secret from a British magician named Charles Morritt, and Charles Morritt was an innovative magician when it came to the use of mirrors and reflections on stage, a direct result of that work that John Henry Pepper was doing. And a few years ago, I wrote a book, and that's the book that you see in the back of the room called The Hiding the Elephant, which is about how those generations of magicians took these principles and dusted them off and changed them over the years. And it's an interesting story, a detective story, about how, how these things were rediscovered and how several generations after this, Houdini was able to basically fool magicians with secrets that they knew for many, many years, uh, able to deceive them by using them in different forms. And that's principally through the, through the showmanship of Houdini and also through the ingenuity of the British magician, Charles Morritt. Again, another completely forgotten magician. Did uh, Houdini have a friend that I uh, asked about Houdini's tragic death. Houdini did have an a, a unexplainably, uh, unexplainably strange death, which is not to say it was supernatural. Houdini uh, was, uh, was a boastful fellow, and uh, at the end of his life, he was giving lectures exposing spiritualism, um, exposing the fraud of spiritualism and spiritualists. And he was speaking at McGill University, and one of his claims was about his, his own physical prowess and how he was able to tighten his stomach muscles and uh, withstand a punch um, without injuring him. And he was visited backstage in his dressing room by some students at the university who asked him about this, and he said he would do it. And one of them uh, let loose with a series of punches and, and injured him. Uh, and that led to his death from a ruptured appendix. Um, several days later, and he tried to go on with the show and was unable to. And in those days, a, a ruptured appendix was basically a death sentence before the statin drugs. And he died in 1926. He died strangely on Halloween. Now, it's a little stranger than that, because um, since then, and was, my friend Bill Kalush has done wonderful work here, uh, since then, it, it seems unlikely that one could be punched and rupture an appendix. It, it doesn't make sense. So there's now speculation that Houdini had an injury appendix, had a, a, a near ruptured appendix, and that that punch was slightly coincidental or, or simply exacerbated the problem. So there's some mystery about that. But it, it's all tied to his personality, principally his boasts uh, and his pride. And he was a very prideful magician and, and a difficult personality for the people who knew him. He was 52 when he died. And it was a shock. It was a, he, he was touring, uh, he was kind of in his prime. And it really devastated people. It, it devastated even the people who didn't admire him. Howard Thurston had put up with him for many years, but he was completely devastated by the death of his old friend. I think, it, I think that Houdini's competition always spurred other magicians. You know, whether they liked him or didn't like him, the fact that he was out there working, nipping at their heels, you know, they admired him for that, and they were shocked with his death. Yes? I was also always told the story as a kid didn't have time to repair himself somehow. That was the story that was around. That, that's exactly the story that, that's, uh, I'm sorry, the, the gentleman stated that Houdini, when he was punched, didn't have time to prepare himself, and that was the common story. And that's exactly the testimony later that the, that the boys, uh, the college students who were in his room, explained. He was laying on a sofa reading um, uh, mail, and as he said to this one student, uh, basically go ahead and try it, he was getting up, and rather than waiting for Houdini to say, I'm ready, uh, I've tightened my muscles, the student let loose as Houdini was still getting into position and that he wasn't able to tighten his muscles. It's still a strange accident. It's a strange and slightly unexplained accident, and it seems like something else was happening at the same time. Uh, Bill, Bill Kalusha speculated whether there was actually some kind of foul play involved because there were a number of people who didn't like Houdini. I'm not so sure I can subscribe to that. I think it was a little more natural than that. And it's it's in keeping with his personality. Yes. I was just wondering, was that do you ever one of those people that tried to go up Niagara Falls in a barrel? His kind of daredeviltry stopped there. He he um, he didn't go over Niagara Falls in a barrel, which was the major question. Uh, he he wouldn't have done quite those kind of things. His feats were always tied to his ability to escape and not simply endure. Uh, although he was tied to, uh, in the public's mind, he was tied to the kind of daredevils that did exactly those sorts of tricks. Yeah. And his success was that he was able to bring these to the stage. You know, some of these things you read about in newspapers or you saw photographs of, but Houdini came to your town and did those things on your vaudeville stage. So he was a star. I mean, he was, he was 
able to bring those kind of daredevil stunts to a show. How did he do it? How did he do his escapes? Oh, I can't tell you that. Uh, you know, he really was, he really did have training as a locksmith, and he studied locks. Um, and he was also not above using incredibly bold, simple secrets. Um, uh, I had a privilege years ago of working with Orson Welles, and Orson Welles saw Houdini work. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you, I mean, I'll tell you one thing that Orson told me. Jim Collins, Jim Collins was the name. You'll find that in Houdini biographies. Jim Collins was Houdini's leading assistant, was his main assistant. He was a completely nondescript man. He was balding, he had, he had little wire glasses. Uh, he looked, th there's almost no way to describe Jim Collins, because there was nothing distinctive about him. And he was always the man who um, uh, was responsible for Houdini's stunts. And Orson insisted that uh, during challenges, when people came up on stage, when a group of men came up on stage, Jim Collins was one of the men that came up on stage. Uh, not that he faked anything, but he always was there standing in the back watching. He watched to make sure nothing was slipped in the lock. He watched to make sure that the key was canned over. He watched to make sure. And as Orson said, if anything happened, Collins would reach over and grab the man by the wrist. And if he had to be taken to the wings, had to be spoken to, that would happen. So Houdini didn't take chances. And uh, despite the Tony Curtis movie, uh, and despite the popular lore, he performed the Houdini Water Torture Cell between 1913 and 1926, 13 years, without ever an accident. He, he broke a bone in his ankle shortly before his death and had to take it out of the show. But um, he always performed it successfully. He did not, he was not stymied by any escape. He was more careful than that. Yes? The, uh, all, all of Detroit was horrified because they thought he had disappeared. He was being swept along by the current. And he would come up and breathe a little bit, but down a little bit, and he ended up an hour or so later down the street. Is that true? Uh, uh, the question was about Houdini's uh, escape in Detroit through through the ice, and that the, and that the current dragged the box along, and that, he, that, they, that they thought he was dead because he didn't come up. Um, it, that story was dramatized in his autobiography, and it was dramatized in the Houdini movie. And there's been quite a bit of scholarship about that. Um, it's clearly an exaggeration. There's no, there's no direct, there's no direct story that, that leads to that. Uh, very dramatic story about Bess Houdini in the hotel, hearing the news voice say, Houdini dead, Houdini's lost. Um, there's, no, there's no actual story that accounts exactly for that. The, the notion that he did underwater escapes through holes in the ice is absolutely true. And the notion that he had trouble finding the hole afterwards is probably true in certain situations. But those stories, uh, like all of his stories, slowly, every time they get told, they get ratcheted up just a little bit more. And then by the time it goes through the hands of a talented ghostwriter, it gets ratcheted up just a little bit more. And so that story became uh, now kind of enshrined in that way and became a popular legend. And was published around the time of his death. That was, by that time, it was, it was canon those great stories about who, when he almost died. Um, we, we know from examining his, his uh, manuscripts that he did use a ghostwriter. He, uh, he accused Robert Don, one of his, one of his most scurrilous accusations was he accused Robert Don of using a ghostwriter to write his book. And it's hard to understand how he could even have done that with a straight face, but uh, for some reason he thought that. Incidentally, the French scholars who have examined Robert Dan's uh, manuscripts, original manuscripts, are now convinced that he did not use a ghostwriter. That he wrote all of those himself. Yeah. One, one more question. Yes, over there. What was Houdini's uh, interest in uh, uncovering more about uh, the spiritualists? Uh, the question is about Houdini's interest in spiritualists and uncovering spiritualism. Uh, there's a tradition of that that went back further than Houdini. John Neville Masklin uh, took on the false claims of spiritualists in London and was dragged into court several times for it and got tremendous publicity out of it. Uh, and this was the generation before Houdini. Uh, Harry Keller, again, uh, the generation before Houdini, also testified uh, in court about uh, spiritualists. And magicians saw it as a way of using their knowledge to 
to promote some good, in other words, to, to expose fraud, because they, they were experts in fraud. Not every magician was convinced. Howard Thurston um, had a very funny way of walking that line, where he believed in spiritualism, even though he thought he had never actually seen it himself. He did attend some seances that he said mystified him. He later thought they might have been fraud. But in general, he, he said he believed in those things and, and didn't pass judgment on it in, in his last years. Uh, but he waged a very active campaign uh, starting in the late teens and into the 20s. And his last tour, his last tour, which is finally when the public saw him do magic, um, uh, he did it very early in his career and then he tried again in 1914. But in his last tour in 1925 and 1926 when he died, it was an unusual show that consisted of three parts. The first part was magic, and by all accounts it wasn't very good. The second part was escapes, and by all accounts it was sensational. And the third part was a, a very energetic lecture exposing fake mediums. And by all accounts that was sensational. It was a kind of perverse revival meeting in which he, in which he called out the fakes in the audience. He would as if I would say here, Madam, would you please stand up? Is it true that your name is so-and-so and that you've been working as a medium in the city of Chicago? And is it true that last week this woman came to you and asked for your help? And, and he, would, he would set up investigators before the city, before he came to the town. He would have reports written up on these people and somehow he would convince them to come to the theater. <laughs> and then he would testify against them and then demonstrate on stage what they had been doing. And it was, it was, it really fed his ego. Was a, it was a sensational way of using his kind of bombastic personality and his ego, and he made headlines with it. Wow. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jim, you did not disappoint. Amazing knowledge of the history of magic. Thank you for being here today. Thank all of you for being here today, and thank you especially to our sponsors, our lead sponsor, Iberia Bank, and to Palm Beach Post. I hope you'll join us next week for the fourth lecture in this five lecture series in which uh, we'll hear from Michael Aronson about Nickelodeons and the history of the movie industry is connected to Pittsburgh. Um, same time, same place. And uh, in the meantime, I hope you'll join us in the back of the room. Uh, Jim is going to be there to sign copies of his book if you'd like. Thank you for being here today.